Welcome. I'm Colin Campbell, professor at uh, Cornell University, Professor Emeritus now. Um, and I'd like to share with you some ideas about a topic that I've been working on for the last 65 years, uh, since I came to Cornell University for graduate studies, working in the area of uh, the science of nutritional, nutritional biochemistry to be more specific. Uh, and before starting, though, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the organization of this effort by Chloe Provera and Isabel Liu, two Cornell students, who have been very kind to arrange for this and uh, have been kind of persistent for me to do it. This is great fun. Um, I want to uh, to talk to you then about uh, this idea of nutrition. There's, it's, it's a lot more than I could ever have imagined when I started this study many years ago. Uh, and there's two words that I've sort of chosen to put in the title, partly thanks to Chloe and Isabel, uh, and that is hope and confusion. Two disparate words, maybe you could say, rather strange, being the same title. But uh, that's what nutrition has been. I think few would doubt that nutrition has really become a very confusing topic for a lot of folks, both in the professions and in the public. But also, I'm going to argue there's hope. We'll see, hopefully, we'll see that uh, near the end. Uh, but before starting, let me uh, give you a little more, something, uh, some information on my background because it really bears witness to what I did during my career. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm, milky cows, that's me on the left. And, um, and then um, I went to graduate school, did my doctoral dissertation uh, that was focused on the idea of improving the consumption of protein, especially protein from animals. And then after getting my first faculty position uh, at Virginia Tech University Department of Biochemistry and Nutrition, I was put in charge of a nationwide program, or, or at, I was responsible for the coordination of a nationwide program of feeding their children in the Philippines. And uh, all three of those have a relationship. Namely, uh, it was all about protein. Uh, being raised on a farm was uh, getting milk, it was said, is a good source of protein, calcium, of course, too, but a good source of protein. Then I did my doctoral dissertation on advancing the cause of protein, uh, and then finally uh, going to the Philippines, and there, like my colleagues, we all thought that these malnourished children were malnourished in large measure because they weren't getting enough protein. Uh, so, on the other hand, uh, I happen to have seen, or got the impression at least, that the children consuming the most protein, and they were much fewer in number, but the children consuming levels of protein more akin to what we do in the West, uh, they were more likely to get liver cancer both things. Then came this study from India, uh, where some researchers had done a study on experimental animals uh, with the idea in mind that if they uh, studied this particular form of liver cancer, started by a chemical, by, by the way, I should say, if they uh, did that study, uh, as they watched cancer grow, their hypothesis was if the animals give more protein, they get some protection. Well, as you can see, there's exactly the opposite. The animals are given the 20% of total calories as protein. Uh, all of them got the liver cancer. Not a big study, of course, but this was in accord with what I thought I was seeing in the children. So I had to do something about it. It was a dilemma. So that brought me back to my lab at Virginia Tech at the beginning. And uh, we worked on this fairly intensively with all, all of which was funded by the National Institutes of Health, specific, specifically the National Cancer Institute, I should add. And what I found during this 27 years of that particular grant uh, we found some really provoking observations, and uh, that, that leads to the larger stories I get into the, into the topic. Um, and I want to show you then just a few slides just to give you some idea of the kind of observations we were making that really brought uh, the idea of uh, nutrition, you know, up to a level that was really very, very exciting and yet very provocative. Namely, what I'm showing here is a cancer growth over the first 12 weeks in this experimental animal study. 
Uh, cancer growth uh, started by a chemical carcinogen that mutates the gene. All cancers basically start with mutations, if you will. But it was started with a chemical carcinogen that causes a mutation and then fed two different levels of protein, like what the NID workers have done. I was interested to see if uh, we might get the same results or perhaps something different. In any case, it turned out that the animals given the higher levels of protein to 20% of total calories. Their cancer grew well those first 12 weeks, and 5% did not, in spite of the fact that both groups got exposure to the same chemical carcinogen that started the cancers growing. Then it was interested in doing something more, just to explore this relationship a little more in some detail. I decided to switch the diets during that 12-week period, feeding them 20% the first three weeks. You can see the growth there. It's Secondly, I'm switching that diet back to five and then turning it off, turning it on, turning it off. That was really very interesting and unique and surprising. We can essentially turn cancer on and off um, just simply by modifying the level of dietary protein in this case. It was quite substantial, as you can see there. As I say, just to emphasize again, all the animals in this case it started with the same exposure to the chemical carcinogen. So now I'm just for a couple of summary comments about that. Uh, namely, cancer development is reversible by protein nutrition. A you know, provocative idea, I should, must tell you. My cancer can be turned on and off. But without showing the details of the second one, we also learned that uh, a genetic mutation which gives rise to the cancer uh, actually may lie dormant for quite a while, if you will. Uh, unless they are given a protein to help grow. It's like planting seeds in the ground and, and they just lie dormant until they're given adequate water, sunshine, and maybe fertilizer. So it's the same deal. We can have mutations that are there that might give rise to some kind of cancer and other sorts of problems too, I should say. But they, they lie dormant and don't grow unless we grow them with the right kind of nutrition. What this also says is cancer is a nutritional disease not a genetic disease. That's a provoking idea because um, even today, and then too, but even today, the cancer community, cancer industry, if I can call it that, they all claim that cancer is a genetic disease. End of story. They're really, really obstinate about this and, and uh, insist that cancer is a genetic disease. And therefore, in order to modify how cancer might work or how it might be treated, we got to find some way to uh, basically deal with that genetic disease, if you will. But here, I, I have a, a question about that. Namely, because cancer genes rarely reverse and go backwards, I mean really rarely, essentially never, because they rarely reverse, therefore, if we want to treat cancer, the inference has been made for many, many years that the only way that can be done is for these cancer cells to be killed by surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy. Now, certainly we ask, let's, let's ask the question then, how well are we doing on that front, treating cancer with chemotherapy? Well, it turns out that the cost of developing a chemotherapy drug is pretty expensive. Um, as of, of 2014, the estimated cost was somewhere between $1.3 and $1.8 billion, actual dollars. It was actually considerably higher if you um, also counted in that the so-called opportunity investment money that could have been gained if it wasn't spent on these drugs. Uh, now, I want to compare that cost with a study that was done, reported in 2004, 16 years ago now, a study done by some Australian and American researchers who wanted to know how well is this cytotoxic chemotherapy working. And they had access to a big database that included of people having passed, uh, having a total of 22 different cancers, along with information on the kind of drugs they, they had to treat their cancers. And so what they, they then were able to do was to ask the question, how well are these chemotherapy agents working? And they measured that by simply looking at the five-year survival rates of these individuals. And what they learned, uh, sadly, was that for these 22 different cancers and the chemotherapy agents, they increased survival by only 2.1%. That's pretty poor. That could have, been, could have happened, so the argument goes, even if they'd done nothing. 
On top of it, the chemo drugs actually cause new cancer. These cytotoxic chemo drugs themselves are carcinogens and they can cause cancer. So the story is not pretty. I think we can conclude that. Now I want to turn your attention to another question that uh, really took a lot of our time, at least 12, 15 years, something like that. Uh, I wanted to explore this uh, question concerning, you know, how does this high protein diet really work? Uh, and so cancer, to do that, we in research, cancer research at least, uh, we tend to divide up the, the stage of cancer into initiation, promotion, and progression over time. First stage being initiation when the mutation is occurring. The second stage being promotion when these cells are dividing, dividing, dividing over a fairly long period of time, presumably. And then the last stage where the cancers may metastasize to other tissues. So we looked for the biochemical explanation of how does that protein work? A total, we looked at a total of about t at least uh, five different mechanisms here in this first stage, uh, all the way from the, the rate at which the carcinogen enters the cells and so forth. I can't get into the details here, but we also did it for the second phase, the promotion stage. So we looked at about five, the first stage, five, the second phase. We had a couple more as well, but here's, here's about 10, 10 mechanisms that now, uh, my turn, I was, I was thinking it as we were doing this that I was attempting to find the key mechanism maybe that might have be affected in some way you could maybe develop a drug and block it. But it turned out we have all these mechanisms working together actually sort of synonymous or, or, or in a sort of a, a symphony-like manner working together to create the response. Now, before going to the next slide, I want to point out to you that in this first section here, you'll see I got arrows going in one direction. That's with a presumption, if you will, that uh, mutation that goes that gives rise to cancer goes only in one direction. But in the last slide, you recall changing protein, uh, dietary protein around, we could go both ways. You could turn on and turn off. So the promotion stage is now generally regarded by some at least as being reversible. It certainly was in our hands. So we looked for about 10 total mechanisms, a couple more I could argue as well. Um, and what it turned out to be, there is no such thing, at least it was my, feeling, my impression at least, there may be no such thing as a key mechanism to account for this effect. There's a whole lot of mechanisms work together. And, and I would suggest as a matter of fact, um, that's generally true for nutrient, nutrient effects. So at least this is their observation, provocative observation, I might add again. Uh, nutritional control of cancer development involves not one, but multiple mechanisms. That challenges, by the way, I should tell you, uh, a fundamental uh, uh, perception involving the drug industry. In other words, drugs are developed, not just for cancer, but for all sorts of things. They, they tend to be developed so that they can be targeted for a specific mechanism, if you will, or a specific cell, or a specific type of cell. That is the foundation of the entire drug industry, trying to develop targeted drugs, mostly. Uh, what we're seeing here in, case, in this case with nutrition, nutrition is almost the antithesis of that. A nutrient can, seems to work by multiple, almost countless numbers of mechanisms all coordinating together. So here we have a contrast. Drugs on the one hand being focused on a, you know, a specific target. Nutrition on the other hand working uh, on a lot of them at the same time. So here's another uh, uh, idea that we worked on uh, that again uh, challenged uh, uh, in a fairly major way an industry obviously. The protein we were using in the first year was casein. I didn't pay that much attention to what protein we were using in those early years. It was just the one that was available uh, on the market, but it was casein is the main protein of cow's milk. Uh, it took me a while to sort of accommodate this idea coming from the farm, but nonetheless, here we were using casein to turn on the, on the uh, cancer. Uh, and we always tried soy and wheat protein at various times and okay. found out that Let's the soy and wheat protein, we found out that the soy and wheat proteins did not work like the animal protein casein. Uh, even when those plant proteins are fed at 20% level, the higher levels. And so we saw a really a very distinguished, very uh, 
um, uh, that's, that's you know substantial uh, difference between let's say these couple of plant proteins and that one animal protein on the other. Now, there's lots of other evidence that also shows something similar with respect to various biological responses. Animal proteins tend to do harm, not tend to. They always say, compared to plant proteins, they're always pushing something that can give rise to in many cases a uh, disease event. So animal proteins, very simply, uh, is suggested to cause cancer, perhaps other diseases, plant proteins prevent. At least that was a, that's what one could, a kind of idea that one can draw from this study. That actually is very challenging, and other people I don't need to say, you know, for the entire food industry. So now, now here, here's yet, yet another question. Namely, how broad based is this uh, nutrition effect, uh, especially protein, if you will? Um, and what I'm suggesting for the last slide is that high protein diets, high animal protein diets, uh, have this, uh, this, this uh, property of being able to turn on the diseases, at least that we, we saw it with cancer, or heart disease, some others at that time. But I had a chance to go back into the literature uh, about 20 years ago to have a look to see what evidence there might be in the literature to show an effect or, or to see if there was an effect of any kind uh, from, let's say, uh, a diet uh, on these various diseases. And you can see here, this effect is very broad. Uh, and the effect I'm talking about is the effect of a diet that is low in protein, like uh, was we were done during the studies. In, in fact, a plant-based whole food, uh, low protein diet. And uh, here you can see there's a large number of cancers that can be prevented, suspended, or in some cases reversed by that, by that diet. Uh, so it leads again to something that's really distinctly different from the traditional drug model. The nutritional effect is broad, involving lots of different diseases. That's better and fast. It's, it may surprise some of you to know that when uh, people start consuming a whole food plant-based diet, the effects can occur within some cases almost 24 hours, certainly 48 hours. And we can see big drops in serum cholesterol, for example, after let's say a week of, of using such food. Um, so it's broad, it's rapid, and if the diet is, cha is changed, is sustained, um, it actually if it can it, it, and reverse the cancer. It certainly has been. I mean, reverse the, these diseases. It certainly has been done with heart disease, as many of you may know. Uh, we can consider that the nutrition coming from a whole food plant is that treats uh, illness as well, and it does so generally without side effects. Quite opposite of that, what you might anticipate from the use of drugs. So I want to just uh, just now briefly just show you a couple of studies in people and humans where this was demonstrated. Dr. Caldwell Esselton at Cleveland Clinton uh, did, a, uh, did quite a lot of work on this over the years and showed, in fact, very convincingly that if he took heart patients, diagnosed heart patients, and treated them with this kind of diet, uh, he got pretty remarkable results. This is the kind of study where, in this case, he had two, uh, close to 200 uh, patients that had been referred to him. He set them down and ran them through about a five hour session and tell them how to do this and usually did it with their spouse. And then after some two to seven years later, called them up and said, how are you doing? Have you had any more problems, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out that actually 89% of these uh, patients complied with the advice and kept doing it. Uh, that is 177 of these patients. Um, and of those who did not, 19, uh, there were 19 of those patients. And so he had an opportunity to compare uh, just doing nothing or just staying on the drugs that they were on compared to this whole food plant based diet. Those on a whole food plant based diet, only one person out of that bunch, less than 1%, you could say, of those people take, taking that diet, using it, actually had another event. Um, of the others, 62% uh, of them had another event. Uh, another heart of that event. Four of them, I think, have passed. So here's a remarkable difference between those who get the low protein plant based diet compared to regular, regular uh, use. Now, I should also point out, too, that um, Dr. Dean Ornish had done much the same thing. 
So between Ornish and Esselstyn, they're well known for the, re, re, the work that they did on heart patients. Now my son, uh, graduate Cornell, uh, actually in theater of all things, um, then went off to, uh, eventually, uh, aside from his acting, he went off to go to medical school, got a uh, doctoral degree, uh, ended up at the University of Rochester Medical Center, and now is running a, a research program there. He's had a chance to actually begin to test this whole fruit plant-based diet in a clinical setting under rigorous conditions. And uh, just reported last December in the British Medical Journal, a rather interesting observation on a case study, uh, a man who had chronic kidney disease. A chronic kidney disease is pretty serious. As many of you may know, there's something like 30 to 40 million people who have that disease, I understand. Uh, and this individual was 69 years old. He was overweight. He had stage three, stage three chronic kidney disease type 2 diabetes, hypertension, he was uh, not well, to say the least. Put him on this diet. And he, of the, of the nine pharmaceuticals drugs he was taking at the beginning, he saw remarkable changes really quickly in the need for the drugs. Insulin, for example, taken for the diabetes, decreased from 210 to 70 units within four days. As I said before, there's a very rapid response. Five stopped their drugs altogether within two months and the, the dose for the other two was halved for that period of time. But probably the most interest was the key indicator of kidney disease. That's the glomerular filtration rate, GFR. This man had stage three uh, kidney disease. Uh, the rate of filtration increased from 45 to 74 milliliters per minute. In other words, that was a 73% increase in four and a half months. Now, keep in mind, this man was just getting very close to having to go do dialysis, a very expensive procedure, a difficult problem for, the, for these patients. He just simply went on this diet. Look what he got. It was really amazing. Sort of like heart disease, same thing. So I wish I could tell you more about nutrition and how it works, uh, especially in the manner in which multiple nutrients work together. And it's not a single nutrient. Uh, but I'll leave it at this because I want to talk about something else at the same time. Uh, I call this kind of nutrition holist nutrition with a W in it, uh, or the concept is holism. It involves multiple nutrients, multiple mechanisms, as, as I showed you there, uh, multiple disease outcomes or reversals, and multiple health improvements. I mean, it's multiple, 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 if you will. Everything working together pr to actually pr to produce a really pretty remarkable result. That all comes down to basically a whole food plant based diet. Uh, this is a highly interactive, integrated, whole system. And I'm going to add minus the cult of animal protein. Now, coming from the farm, growing up with animal protein, believing in it, starting my career that way, uh, it was somewhat hard for me to say that. But in reality, especially when it gets the literature, our belief in animal protein is way, way overdone. Uh, we don't really need it, as I'll show you in a little bit later. Now, from that, I'm going to suggest the dietary goals for going this direction are fairly simple. Uh, you can just do two things, more or less. Uh, get most of what you're going to get. Namely, just remember to consume whole foods. But that, that's the best way to go about that. It doesn't mean you can't chop them up and cook them and stuff like that. But uh, they, they should be whole foods when you're consuming all the nutrients in the food, more or less, simultaneously. Uh, and then at the same time, avoid um, animal-based foods. Just simple, pretty simple. We can do more things than that, but that will accomplish most of what we need to need to think about. Okay, how does that compare in contrast with medicine? Medical practice is the antithesis of nutritional uh, treatment. Medicine is a, a very reductionist science, very reductionist med uh, practice, if you will. They tend to think of one disease having one cause involved with one mechanism. That's the way the entire trade has occurred over these many, many decades. And that, with that thought in mind, if they can find the mechanism that accounts for a particular disease, maybe they can develop a drug for it. That's really what it, it is in a nutshell. So uh, reductionist medicine, that is all medicine essentially, uh, relies on targeted drugs uh, for which there are common side effects. Whole nutrition, for example, uh, does has multiple effects on multiple diseases, not targeted, and essentially no side effects. That is a big difference from what is taught in medical schools. In medical schools, 
nutrition is not taught, not in a single medical school in the United States or elsewhere for that matter. Uh, it's a very different, it's just a very different animal. I hate to use that word, but it's a very different uh, sort of concept from uh, drugs. So holistic nutrition is not taught in medical schools because they're just, they could, they're polar opposites in terms of thinking about how to use them for treating patients. There's also no uh, institute, no nutrition institute dedicated to nutrition of the 27 institutes at NIH. That's the major funding agency in the world, actually. Um, and so nutrition is not considered a serious medical science. And I'm going to say that it should be the most important medical science of all. Uh, there's another comment I'd like to make from time to time without defending it here, namely that nutrition done this way can do more for creating health than all the pills and procedures combined. It's a dramatic difference. So the rest of this story, or much of the rest of this story, was told in a book that I wrote with my son, Tom, who I mentioned before, um, uh, that called the China Study, a name drawn from a major study we did in China as part of this, this story. Uh, that book has done fairly well. It's really gone around. It, it's been far better than I ever thought it would because it actually produces results. That's the feedback we've been getting. I mean, now it turns out that uh, we've sold over 3 million copies of Still Going Strong. That was first published in 2005. This is the second edition here in 2016. And there's been more than 50 foreign language translations. Now, recently, because of this uh, uh, crisis that we now have with this uh, viral disease called coronavirus, uh, I got some calls to uh, inquire whether or not I had any comments to make about this. And I recall that indeed, we were working with some viral diseases in China. Back when we did this study uh, in 1983, and then analyzed a lot of the results, or analyzed the samples, I should say, from 1983 until about 1988. So these analyses done during that time. There's, we, we actually were working with four different viruses in addition to the chronic degenerative diseases. And here I'm giving you a scheme on one virus that we studied some detail that has, in my view, uh, possibly a, tr a great deal of relevance for our current COVID-19 problem. Namely, just look at this, at this scheme here first. We start out with, let's say, here's the um, hepatitis B surface antigen, we call it. In other words, it's the virus. It's the active virus in the community someplace. It basically uh, then uh, attacks the human host. Uh, and so a person tests, tests positive for the virus, okay? It's, but it's asymptomatic. Let's say a person now is, has the virus. It's uh, not really causing any symptoms yet, so we'll call that those people uh, positive test uh, individuals. Now, this particular virus, really deadly and nasty, uh, goes on when it's still when the virus is acting. It goes on to form liver cancer. In fact, together with high protein diets, it's the major cause of liver cancer in the world. So we're going from symptom asymptomatic to symptomatic situations. That's one pathway. The virus comes in, goes and does its dirty work. But obviously, for all viruses, really, this is true for all. The body tries to get rid of them, neutralize them, if you will, create uh, immunity. So what the body does is sees this virus. It creates an antibody, among other things. It creates an antibody to uh, make it immune, okay? And this work was done in China back in, as I say, in the 80s. Uh, that I won't have a chance to talk to here. But in, in that study, we collected a total of 367 um, factors and measured them in the blood, urine, and, and questions, and food, and so forth. And so we have nutritional factors for these two pathways. And so again, just a quick review. The hepatitis comes into the host, can form in the, the uh, symptoms, or be deactivated, uh, made immune. And so my question is, uh, basically, uh, what kind of nutrition, if any, favors virus immunity? That would be nice to know if we can learn something about that. Well, it turns out we had data on that. And here, I hope it's not get, it's get too complicated, but um, these, uh, I'm listening here, just some of the variables were statistically significant. One star significant, the probability of 0.01, two stars 0.05. I mean, 0.05, the first one, uh, two stars 0.05, and three is 0.001. In other words, highly, highly significant. What did we see here? 
Okay, so we're measuring an antigen, an antibody, in a total of 8,900 adults of that age. Um, and what we see is that liver cancer, this M stands for mortality, mortality of liver cancer is highly related, highly significant related to antigen, as you would expect. People who have an active virus get liver cancer, period. Um, sorry, get ahead of myself. Uh, and then two other things that were really kind of novel and interesting, uh, primarily because of the levels. Uh, plasma cholesterol and total cholesterol in these individuals that are antigen positive, they're associated with the uh, antigen uh, and the liver cancer, same time. Uh, and what, what made this pretty remarkable, the significant, the 0.05 level, the reason it's significant is because animal protein is considered the major factor causing increases in cholesterol. And in China, the animal protein was only about one-tenth of what it is here. So they're consuming little animal protein in this particular study. Uh, but nonetheless, there's still enough to actually be associated with the active virus. Contrast, the antibody, the inactive virus, um, these are positive, they go up together. In this case here, we got animal food, dietary animal food consumption, percent of animal food, percent or the cholesterol consumption. There, the more of that is consumed, the lower the antibody levels. That's what we actually saw. We measured antigen in these people, serum antigen and serum um, antibodies, and it turned out the animal foods depressed, or at least are associated with lower antibody levels, and it was associated with increased antigen levels and with liver cancer, of course. So animal food, small amount, favors live virus and cancer. Not good. In contrast, here's uh, the uh, a birth situation involving plant food. The plant food, is, as indicated here by these factors, these are dietary intakes. The plant food, the greater the plant food consumption, the lower the antigen and the higher the antibody. And highly significant. In other words, eating vegetables was a, had a high degree of significance of forming antibody. Uh, so plant food favors Im immunity. The animal food, in fact, favored the, the cancer being formed. So I can summarize it really quickly here. This, as I say, is 8,900 people. It turns out that those who are exposed to this virus, they have the antigen, they're tested positive. Plant food, if they're, if they're consuming more plant food, they are more likely to form antibody. Animal food is exactly the obvious, opposite effect. And the fact that these, these data were kind of multiple in a way was really interesting. It's highly, highly significant that consuming plant-based foods basically represses, I'm, I'm sorry, the plant-based food, the more plant foods consumed, more the, the greater the likelihood of the person becoming immune. Now, there's another part of this story too that I mentioned early on. Now, look at this little chart up here in the left-hand corner. Uh, you recall I said that here's the positive antigen in the person forming antibody, maybe. Uh, and lots of nutritional factors there we're looking at. And the, this antigen, positive antigen, can cause the symptoms, okay? Now, how do I, what, what can I say about these symptoms? Well, we took that information, as I say, 30 years ago, brought it back home, and did some animal studies on it. And here's the results, pretty remarkable. What we found was, and these are liver, we call them uh, liver sections or you know, histological sections of the liver where the cancer is being formed. Uh, I've got four sets of slides, four slides here. One of them, this is, this is in an animal that did not have the virus, so this is normal cells. These three over here had um, exposure to the virus. They're all affected with the virus. We call them transgenic, if you will. It turns out that the animals given the high level, highest levels of protein, that's 20%, by the way, we saw a lot of black stuff. That black stuff is indicative of the formation of cancer. That's in a high protein. The medium level, less so. The low level, even though they're infected with the virus, no cancer. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. We also measured other things like messenger RNA for you biochemists in the group, uh, and so really it was, it was very consistent. The high protein diet activated the, I, Sorry, I won't stay there. Sorry about that. The high protein that activated the virus to form the cancer, as indicated here by this black stain. I mean, really, really pretty strong. That was, uh, and then uh, I want to, now taking that, that's a virus model. 
it's a virus that causes uh, liver cancer. It's not the COVID virus. I mean, the COVID virus has other symptoms, but all viruses in, in principle are doing the same thing. They invade the host and they cause some problems, period. The, the host in turn tries to form antibodies to get rid of it. That's the way it works in, in a very general way. Now I'm summarizing here what this hypothesis based on the hepatitis B virus might mean for the, for the uh, COVID uh, infection. Namely, we go back here and again, we've got the, uh, the viral out there in the community, if you will, in the, in the so-called antigen state. It uh, comes in and, and a person gets infected. Uh, not yet uh, symptoms are there, but they're testing positive. And eventually they go on to form the, the very serious problems. Or well, they can form the antibody. What I'm suggesting, and my hypothesis is, and, and this is, uh, I, I think, <laughs> I'm really very enthused about the possibility. Uh, the whole food plant-based diet, sorry about that, the whole food plant-based diet actually prevents, it, it would inhibit the conversion of the antigens, test positive people, from getting the symptoms. And instead, the whole food plant-based diet, for a variety of reasons that I won't have a chance to get into here, would be favored to form antibody. So people who are infected with this virus, if they were to go on a whole food plant-based diet, and that diet, as I said before, is known to be working very rapidly. Uh, if they're testing positive, if they were to go on a whole food plant-based diet, it's my suggestion, hypothesis, if you will. I don't have any proof of this. But in any case, what this evidence tends to suggest, if they were a whole food plant-based diet, they are more likely to become immune without suffering the consequences. I think this is really staggering information. It's a way for people who have been diagnosed and are positive to change the diet. Do it now and, uh, and see what the results might be. Now, there's another angle to this that makes it even more significant. Namely, we know that from the COVID virus uh, story that most of the people who are uh, really susceptible to the, the problem with this virus are 60 years and, and older, 95% uh, of whom are basically suffering from poor nutrition, coming from the wrong diet. I mean, most people are not using this whole food plant-based diet, they're using a high protein, Western type of diet. And, uh, and so they're older and uh, the poor nutrition, okay? The poor nutrition in this particular case gives rise to the degenerative diseases in at least 95% of them. They're the ones susceptible to getting the viral disease. So we got what is sometimes called comorbidities. We got two different, uh, uh, illnesses here operating at the same time. It turns out, it turns out that the whole food plant-based diet, according to my hypothesis, would prevent that. And certainly we know that it would prevent these diseases. Up. We really have ample information for that. In fact, we have a lot of information that those diseases can be resolved in a matter of days and something like diabetes. But you go on a whole food plant-based diet, remove that part of it, then they're not nearly as susceptible. But at the same time, the whole food plant-based diet at the same time could be operating on the viruses as well. I, I, I think it's kind of an exciting proposition. Now, one thing I should say about this, if in fact it works as I'm suggesting here, um, the whole food that once a person goes on this diet, it's not like a drug, drug treatment. If they start using this, they've got to stay with it. Because particularly in the case of the coronavirus, the coronavirus are kind of hang around, a lot of viruses will. And in fact, if they just sort of knock it off for a bit for consuming this food for a few days and then forget it, the, the, the people presumably immune may re, become reinfected. And so we see some of that. I, I'm hearing now stories that people who are thought to be immune, forming the antibodies, all of a sudden are testing positive to some extent. That would not happen in this case here, according to my hypothesis. The whole food plant-based diet will repress the formation of these degenerative diseases in the first place and reverse them, and also repress, repress the activity of the, of the viral agents themselves. Okay, so much for that. I want to show you another angle of this story about nutrition that I find fascinating. What I'm showing here at the upper left-hand corner is the relationship between uh, animal protein intake and breast cancer. Now, really, in the original study that was uh, total fat and animal protein, but they're correlated. So this is what's my my uh, uh, my uh, my suggestion really is: is more like animal protein. And by the way, the individual who did that, a very well-known uh, 
uh, researcher at the University of on, on Western Ontario, who's a friend of mine. I checked this out with him. It's my interpretation, his data. So he said it was great. He liked it. And so what we see here is that if we increase animal protein across different countries, as he did, you see a, just a beautiful straight line relationship. It's not true for plant protein. It's just for animal protein. You see that line relationship? That's really pretty impressive. What the, and it goes right through the origin, more or less. And so what it says is that, to, in theory, in little animal food, it's going to cause an increase in those diseases. And so we see the same thing for breast cancer incidence, uterine cancer incidence, colon cancer. These are all different studies by different people. Renal cancer incidence, uh, prostate cancer, heart disease, a couple of different heart diseases. What, what, what I'm showing you here is that here's a batch of correlation studies for different populations. And what we see a line when we, when we focus on the role that animal food might be playing, what we find is that any addition of animal food begins to theoretically begins to increase risk of all these diseases at the same time. Okay, now I wanna translate that, keep that in mind, keep that in mind. I wanna translate that into uh, something that was done uh, with our dietary recommendations. Uh, and what I'm talking about here is the recommendation for dietary protein in the U.S. population. The recommendation for dietary protein as a percent of filled with calories. What I'm showing you here is the range of uh, important metrics. Namely, this is the minimum protein requirement, 5 to 6%. This is the recommended dietary allowance for everyone. That's enough protein, if you will. Uh, this is the range that we that 95% of us are living in. We're we're living with a protein total protein content of somewhere between 11 and 20, 20 some percent. By the way, the whole food plant based, if that's all there is, it would pour any kind of whole food plant based diet, even ones that are less nutritional, will have enough protein to meet our needs. We don't need any extra protein from animal food. So that old story about needing animal foods to to get the protein is, is really not true for all sorts of reasons. I'm just sort of graphically summarizing it here for, for you. So plant proteins have enough protein. The average, by the way, the average uh, protein, uh, the dietary protein in the form of animal protein in the Western diet, the, of the total protein that we consume, this black range, of the total amount, 75 to 80% of it is animal protein. So we're consuming a really, Really, a, a, a majority of our protein we're consuming is coming from animal-based foods. Put that together with the, the slope I just showed you in the last slide. Uh, and during this, in this range here, we are living in the danger zone. Most all of us are, if you're using animal food. We, the animal food, in theory, begins around here and sort of builds it up. And so we're consuming animal food to get all that protein. So this is really, a, that's what that represents. It turns out that, and, then, and so I'm showing you this slide compared to what it was before. So, you know, nine, 10 percent is enough. If we get 15 to even 20 percent by plant foods, no problem. That's whole food. That's an entirely different uh, situation. Uh, but the animal food is, is, of course, different. So what happens? Here's the big kicker. The recommended upper safe limit. I'm sorry, my picture is not coming down across here. Yeah, the, the recommended upper safe limit for protein as judged by authorities and the Food Nutrition Board in 2002 was said to be 70, 35%. Inane, absolutely, I, I can't believe that this really happened. There was a committee that decided that we could consume protein up to 35% of calories in the face of all this here. Total nonsense. I'm, I'm going to suggest for your thinking, if you're listening, this is the, easily the most um, substantial uh, uh, error in policy ever conducted in the last hundred years as far as nutrition is concerned. It's really, in my mind, immoral because if people are being told they can have up to that level there, that's a license to just consume as much protein as you want. And especially, by the way, you can get it from animal food. It's, it's, it's basically uh, said in a way that encourages more animal food consumption. Now I want to and just remember that for a moment. I'm going to take you back to, to another part of my story that really brought this to, the, to light for me. In 1982, I was invited to be on a, on a national committee expert panel to write a report on diet and nutrition cancer. It was being organized by the National Academy of Sciences, and I was one of the 13 members of that particular committee. We made a modest report in 1982, you know, consume more vegetables, fruits, and grains, that's no big deal. 
We suggested also to reduce total fat intake from 35 or so percent down to 30 percent. And then uh, this book was organized around different nutrient groups, but they didn't have one on protein. And that was the area I was working in. I was one of only two on that 13 member committee that was actually doing research in this area in the laboratory. I wanted to write one on protein because that's what I, I was beginning to see something really interesting there. The committee wasn't terribly excited about my doing that, but I insisted they were very kind. I said, okay, you write your chapter. So I wrote the chapter on protein. I hit a hot button. When, and I was suggesting that, hey, protein can have this effect of increasing cancer. The rest of the committee were kind of nervous about that. They did various things not to affect those consequences. Well, then after that, the committee had asked me to uh, testify before uh, Senate and House committees on our findings. And that report was the most sought after report in the history of the National Academy of Sciences. So I did that. I was, uh, unfortunately, became very public. Uh, first, to give the testimony, uh, being on uh, PBS uh, television, uh, featured in some magazines and that sort of thing. I really got out there and, and usually I would end up talking about protein. So that caused a problem in my professional community. Two of the leaders in the community tried but failed to expel me from my society, the American Institute of Nutrition, 1982. I had to go to Washington and hold hearing uh, because they said I had betrayed my nutrition research community. That was at a time when the executive council had just chosen me to be their new president. And so they wanted to throw me out of the society the first time that had been done in the 60 year history of that society. They failed, but they shouldn't certainly try. They were people who were representing the livestock industry, I must tell you. You can probably guess it, but that's who they were. A few years after that, not very long, uh, I had put in a supplemental research project uh, application for research in China, which was just underway at that time. And uh, I was I actually uh, one, sorry about this, I get, sorry about that, we'll catch up here in just a second. Doing this online stuff, I don't know, quite a trick. Okay, so okay, there's that, there's the consequences. Uh, so in any case, I put an application in, and I've served on those panels, they're called study sections. And we were awarded the full funding for $7 million to add on a dimension to our China, to work in China. That was very exciting. I, it was the biggest loss I ever had, I think, during my entire career. But it was awarded, it was recommended for funding, for funding. I went down to pick up the money, essentially. I was invited to come down, and one of the institutes put up their share, the Cancer Institute did. But I was faced with a letter from another institute who brought in a letter unsigned. It said, simply said, uh, friends of the Institute of Aging. They were alleging, this letter, unsigned letter, alleged that, I, that my work in China, not then known by the public very much, it alleged that I was a fraud. And so I never got the $7 million to follow up that study, which would have been enormously uh, helpful if I had had that study. Just a couple of things. These are just a couple of the things that I had to put up with um, during that time. Later on, I was teaching a course in nutrition with some of this kind of information, um, and my course was canceled without my knowledge. This is during the 1990s, um, and it was transferred, and I went through the, the usual system, and they just simply wouldn't allow it to be taught. Some between three and 5,000 students had signed a petition. I don't know if that's why I was told that number, uh, but they wouldn't re reinstate it. Uh, I transferred the course, it suggests I do that, to a startup online program, which was just really struggling to survive at the time. And I, I think they thought I was going to be shopped out to, uh, sent out to Siberia. We put them in there. Our program turned out to do really well. And a few years later, we were number one of the two or 300 courses that were being taught. Uh, the Cornell Communications Center, which had uh, done a lot of uh, reporting on my work over the years, in fact, it was said that he, myself, and Carl Sagan were the two who had the most public uh, information at the university. In any case, uh, we transferred the download program, and then the Cornell Communications Center wrote up a story that, uh, about our rather unusual uh, success. That story was blocked by the administration. It said it can't go out. So the nonsense continued. Now, it turns out 
that the individual who blocked that course was my supervisor, head of the department, a man well known by all of us to be a substantial consultant to the dairy industry. Okay? He canceled the course. He is the one who then became very influential in Washington. He was the one who was the chairman of the committee that decided the 35% level. He was also at the same time the, the uh, uh, chairman of the Dietary Guidelines Committee, the food pyramid. And so he was circulating on campus, off campus, and these are the kinds of things that he ended up doing. I'm just citing this example here, just to say what can happen behind, this, behind the scenes. It probably doesn't have to see. And it, it, what really happened in this particular case was a, the wholesale attack on the information I was involved in. And of course, a wholesale attack in a number of cases of trying to get me dismissed, um, and trying to ruin my reputation as much as they possibly could. So he's a major consultant of the dairy industry to participate in those panels. Now, here's a picture on campus. Um, this is a new building, relatively new building, I should say. Now it's four or five years old, I guess. But uh, in any case, it's a new building. And I think that picture says it all. That's the dairy science department. Incidentally, that's the same building that my lab was in as a graduate student. Now, I, I, I say all of this, I, I really detest, you know, saying negative things about my university. Cornell is a great, great university. It's a great school. I would advocate any people who want to have their children consider, you know, to come here. It's a great place. Um, the famous uh, song, Far Above Curious Waters, is probably the most famous college song in the country. That's neither here nor there, but uh, Ezra Cornell, the founder in the 1860s, in that period, 60s, 70s, he said this, an institution where any person can find instruction in any study. I've been a proud Cornelia, I have to tell you. There, my immediate family and myself, we've had seven degrees from Cornell, seven degrees. I've gone out across the country and lectured on behalf of Cornell. And here's what they do. I had the largest program in research in the nutrition department, which was number one in the country, I had that for many years, lots of students. Yet they felt that I was expendable, my work was expendable because they're influenced by the industry, pure and simple. In other words, this institution can, can offer any instruction, and now I'm going to throw in their proper nutrition. The, the nutrition that has been offered is not real nutrition, this old fashioned stuff. All of this is related to uh, the question of whether or not we're tenured. Therefore, whether or not we have academic freedom. Uh, and here's a chart uh, put together, I think it was by the A, the American College of University Professors, uh, during the period from about 1970 until about 2011 or so, 10. Um, uh, here's the, the uh, proportion of faculty who are tenured in blue. You can see it's going down. Tenured faculty is going down. In contrast, the, per, the, the percentage of people who are non-tenured, you know, short appointments, uh, adjunct professors, instructors and the like, that's going up. So in other words, the faculty at a place, even like Cornell, as big a name as that, the faculty are higher and higher proportion over the recent two decades or so, higher and higher proportion are now faculty who are not on tenure tracks. They're, they're for hire. They're for hire. That's the way I like to put it. They might be hired for two years, one year, teach a course here or there, maybe for five years, whatever. They're, they're, they're not protected. They don't have academic tenure. Now, I can tell you in a setting like I have been in, where there's a lot of sensitivities, these people have to stay in line. If they, if, and you can see, I just showed you that if there's an industry influence on the outside, uh, very imposing influence, if someone speaks not exactly what is expected for them to say, I can tell you they will not be renewed. It's that simple. So I'm going to suggest that academic tenure in this country and academic freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of speech, quite frankly, is being really almost eradicated from the institutions most responsible for demonstrating what freedom of speech is all about. It's a very sad commentary. But you see this this that down here for 2011 is that that level right and there's only at that time only nine percent of of professors were full professors and tenure in other words they got all the all the uh, uh, promotion they were entitled to and their tenure i'm more than nine percent but uh that i don't know what it is now but 
for all practical purposes, academic tenure is almost non-existent. Oh, they don't say they got tenure, they got tenure. But let me tell you, there's a lot of forces at, at play that in my kind of area where sensitivity, sensitivity is concerning human health, it's a big problem. I want to finish off here just with a couple of observations. Because I'm describing a situation at a university that relates to a national uh, concern. Namely, let's, let's look at this question concerning health spending in dollars per capita. There's 39, I think it is, no, yeah, 39 uh, countries, Western, more, more or less Western countries, uh, and the numbers of dollars bit spent per capita. Here's the US up here. See, we're above all of them. We're above all of them. And I'm going to say, is that because of our illiteracy? We don't understand nutrition. Nutrition is, is this, as I said before, is not taught in medical schools and doctors don't reimburse for, for offering those services anyhow. Nutrition is over, just out of the picture. If we were to learn what kind of food we we're supposed to be eating and the kind of creates health and all the consequences it has on the environment, the cost of health care and so forth, it would be enormous. And a lot of this here is up here because the institutions are supposed to be telling the truth or not telling the truth. And they have the truth. They haven't been for a long time. And I, I'm going to say this is a really sad commentary on the loss of academic freedom in this country. Here's, here's where we are too, and another sort of next week, if you will. There's a number of uh, drugs we use in terms of dollars per capita, same countries. Here we are way up here at the job. We use the most drugs per capita. Again, nutrition literacy. We wouldn't be using those pharmaceuticals if the truth were told about what food can do. If we were told what food can do. If we understood the power of nutrition, not only to prevent disease, but to actually treat disease. Can you imagine? Treat heart disease, treat diabetes, treat obesity, treat a whole bunch of different conditions, all with the same protocol. You can pick what plant foods you want, more or less, just uh, have plant foods and you get 95% of the gain you're going to have. Now all of that, so it says we ought to be doing pretty well in terms of some of the metrics. It turns out we spend the most on healthcare, we use the most drugs, but here we are in life expectancy. Look at this. Sad. 44th oh, for those individuals 65 years and older. Nutrition literacy. I wrote a second book that came out in 2013, expounding on the sort of theoretical basis for what I'm talking about, suggesting it's a new worldview. That itself has been a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and I, I'm really, as you probably can tell, I'm really passionate about this whole thing because the public is not getting to know what they can know, how to maintain health. Enormously impressive stuff. And I got one new book now coming out near the end of this year, in December. The title of it is The Future of Nutrition. And insiders look at the science why we keep getting it wrong and how to start getting it right. I would like to end there and simply say that I've spent my 65 years doing all I can to learn what I can uh, and just trying to live by the, by the facts as I see them. For me, it was a complete reversal of where I started, advocating consumption of more animal-based food, more animal protein, complete reversal. So I learned a lot about what it takes to go against the, against the stream. We have a course, that course I told you about before that's now in the online course, is still the number one uh, course in many ways uh, at the Cornell program. We call it Plant-Based Nutrition Certificate. We have a lot of success. We've had about 50,000 graduates that get a certificate, 50,000 graduates uh, for this. And doctors, you can get CME credits. We have world renowned faculty involved. Very excited about this. That's our course. You can go online, look at our plant-based nutrition, um, and uh, consider the possibility of taking some education. Again, I want to finish. Acknowledge some Cornell students, Chloe Cabrera and Isabel Liu. They did it for this year. There were earlier students, Jesse Stahl, Ella Stevens, and quite a number of others. They, the students have been very kind since I took my emeritus position, having me come back and lecture because this is one of those lectures. So thank you so much for listening, and the best of health to all of you.